When the news broke about Larry, oh, my teammates flew from all over the country to go to Larry's house to comfort him. Wow. They, and still to this day, my teammates and I, my teammates, my ride or dies, have no relationship because they chose John and Larry over my truth. And it wasn't until they recovered the 37,000 images of child pornography, including images of Larry's own children oh on the hard drive that were in the trash can about to go out to the garbage that day, that they actually said, well, I guess mm -hmm. this could have happened. Welcome back, everybody. Today's program is important, and I think it can save lives and change lives. And the woman that I get to drink a little wine with today, <laughs> I've already had a little, uh, and share this wonderful conversation with is Sarah Klein. Sarah is an attorney. Uh, she's a sexual abuse advocate. Uh, she's a remarkable woman. She's brilliant. And she, uh, but you probably know her because of Larry Nasser. She was the first known victim to come forward, not to come forward, but the first victim of Larry Nasser, who was the head of uh, USA Gymnastics. He was the doctor that uh, he was a serial pedophile. Yep. And he ended up, you know, there were 500 some odd girls' lives that he impacted negatively and ruined. And it was because of women like Sarah coming forward that he finally met some form of justice. And so we're going to talk about all issues related to that today with this wonderful woman, Sarah Klein. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. And it's so good to have you. We've been laughing already off camera. So <laughs> I know. Well, what is it's very serious topic, though, yeah. that we're going to talk about yeah. today. So I want to ask you first, I thought it was interesting. I'm doing the research. Yeah. And the news comes out that this guy who had, by the way, 37,000 images of children pornography on his hard drives and yep. stuff. This guy was just a, like so many people that are out there sort of just closeted ruining people's lives. Yeah. But it was fascinating to me because you said when you first heard that, you know, women had come forward, you're like, no, not my Larry. Yeah. Not him. You'd been to, evidently to his wedding. Yep. And that it didn't even occur to you as a, a woman at that time in your 30s yeah. that he had actually been abusing you starting at the age of eight, probably victim number one. So yeah. how is that possible that you didn't even process all those years that you were being abused? Yeah, it's a really hard thing for people to swallow mm -hmm. to say, wait a minute, you were 36 years old, you're an Ivy League graduate, you have all these Ugh. degrees, you have a JD and MBA. What do you mean you didn't realize? Mm -hmm. um, my answer to that is this started when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. The brain is not fully formed until you're 25 years old. Okay. An eight-year-old child doesn't even, you know, know sometimes how to read, how to, like, sure. it, you, you put yourself back in those shoes. And it was so normalized. Everybody in the gym had to go back to Larry mm -hmm. to receive this treatment. Now. You probably also know our coach, John Gedart, committed yeah. suicide in February after being charged with 20 some um, counts of sex abuse, human trafficking, child abuse, all the things. Mm -hmm. And so we're in the gym and we're terrified of John Gedart. He's mm -hmm. a bastard. You said he was even worse than he, Nassard in some ways. He's you. a bastard. He's yeah. a narcissist. He was a narcissistic piece of. <laughs> who screamed and yelled and hurt us and harmed us. And so our little eight-year-old psyches Gosh. are so f***ing broke down. Yep. And then you need to go back to this room and see Larry Nassar, who was the kindest, most loving, gentle, warm, nerdy, goofy mm -hmm. guy. And he's an adult and you're a child. Yep. And he says, lay down here, I'm gonna stretch this, I'm gonna fix this. And all you wanna do is get back out there to impress John. Your whole life rides it or dies based on John's mood that day. Gotcha. And so you go back there and you get, you do whatever Larry tells you to do. Mm -hmm. And because I was conditioned That's starting at such a young age and groomed yep. and loved by this person yep. at such a young age, mm -hmm. It never dawns on you 20 years later Incredible. that he's sexually abusing you. Yeah. And it was also really couched in this medical treatment. Yes. So his words, his language, his move, it wasn't like bend over and I'm going right. to do that. It was like, I'm going to stretch you and your hip is so tight and this and that. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually helping you. And I, can I ask you something yeah. about that? So to me, that your story isn't different than any other story, though. Meaning, what yeah. I mean by that is, 
some of the same principles apply. So people that are pedophiles like this or abusers, they condition. That's a word you use. That's the yeah. first thing I thought of. I didn't yeah. think, just candidly, I didn't think, well, how didn't you know? Yeah. I wanted to understand how our brain sort of works and normalizes an abuse like this. Yeah. And so one, you were conditioned. But I think people listening to this that have children or that you may be listening to this and wondering whether someone's being inappropriate with you. They are master manipulators. Yeah. They're creating a normalcy around the environment that they abuse you in. Would you not agree with that? They do yeah. everything they can. Totally. Their whole life totally. existence is about getting to get off on whatever it is they do to you. So they're going to try to do everything they can to normalize the situation. In your case, it was athletics. Yep. I'm stretching you. It'll help your performance. But yep. In fact, what he was doing, without being too graphic, he yeah. was penetrating you with his fingers yeah. vaginally, anally, yeah. as an eight, nine-year-old little girl. Yeah. And somehow, even with that, creating a normalcy around the environment for it. So that's one of the things that's a telltale sign that they do. A hundred percent. And it's always like, I'm a sexual abuse attorney now, mm -hmm. and, you know, representing lots of survivors in high profile cases. Mm -hmm. And I always say, and I don't want to minimize anybody's story, mm -hmm. but it's always the same mm -hmm. different perpetrator, different, you know, venue. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's in a school or maybe it's in a church or maybe it's, you know, but it's, it's the same exact stuff mm. that you see over and over and over. They groom you, they're kind to you, they pay attention to you, they love you, they make you feel special. Then they start to psychologically penetrate you yep. and break you down. Mm. And um, or you have a voice like John Getter saying, you're worthless, you're nothing. And so you're so broken and then it's a control thing and there's mm. all these different sort of grooming techniques. Same different day. I was. Uh Gosh, it's amazing the way that you say that because I'm picturing different things. I was at the ESPYs when you received the Arthur Ashe Award on, on, your, on behalf of yourself and all these other victims, and you did an amazing job. Your Thank speech was you. so eloquent. And then you're telling me today that you wrote it yourself, which makes it even more amazing yeah. to me. But I was there, and I'm going to say something I never said on the show before. I was listening to you thinking, gosh, that's terrible that that happened to them. And then it did make me reflect on even incidences in my own life. And there was an incident when I was a little boy that I can't completely process. I'm not exactly sure what happened there, mm -hmm. but here I am a 50 year old man and I still wonder what went on there. I was in a locker room after a football game in the seventh grade with a PE teacher guy. And I remember him locking the door. We we're the only two guys in there. Yeah. I remember him kind of like tickling me a little bit. And I remember getting unbelievably, my brain can't frankly process if or what happened after that, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But I do know that I remember it. Yep. And I do know that it made me uncomfortable. And I should have told somebody. And that's, I think, one of the lessons you would at least share with everybody now, that if you are someone listening to this or you have a child that tell somebody about this. Is that not yeah. one of the main things people need to know? Tell somebody about it, but teach your child the language to be able to tell somebody about it. Okay. So back in the 80s, you know, I'm eight years old. I've never heard of sexual abuse. My red flags never went up. Mm. And I can't even say that I necessarily remember feeling even uncomfortable. Sure. I just thought mm -hmm. it's normal. Mm -hmm. And 25 years old, Ivy League graduate, first year law student, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. going back to Michigan State, going out to lunch with my dear friend mm -hmm. and going back to his clinic and letting him work on my body and do this and do that. That's and a well. still being penetrated by Larry fucking Nasser well. at 25 years old. My and gosh, so I did not know that piece. It can happen wow. to anybody. I talked well, to a young woman yesterday who, who became a part of a cult at 19 and mm. was in the cult for, for seven years. When you're in it and this godlike person who you think loves you mm. is telling you this stuff, it's really hard to decipher. So absolutely, yes, if your red flags go off or your child's red flags, teaching them about red flags, teaching them about warning signs is critical, mm. but sometimes mm. it's not even going to register when you're talking about a brain that is not fully formed. And also, by the way, so educational for me to hear that, that that was even ongoing up into your 20s because ah. it was conditioned in, yeah. in the normalcy. So there may not be flags. I've also had people that I coach that so happen to have been abused, meaning they're high profile entertainer for yeah. a couple of them I'm thinking of, obviously would remain anonymous, that I work with, but that those issues have reared their head and they were abused, molested as children young young children and one of the things they said was not only was it normalized but this is something that 
we're really going deep here, but yeah. that it, in some cases they were shamed or it felt good. Yeah. And that, that of it feeling good, that first experience when someone's doing something to you that's never been done to you before makes you even more afraid to come forward about it or you think it's a normal and good thing because it's not ne it's not necessarily painful it can right. be right but not necessarily be that way true right. that's another piece of it in your case it was more athletics and getting ready to perform but yeah it doesn't always necessarily mean physical pain i guess is my point yeah i had a, a teenage client who was a united states figure skater and her coach in his 40s is having sex with her for years upon years. She's 13, 14, 15, 16. Mm -hmm. And at his sentencing hearing in Minneapolis, the defense attorney said, on behalf of my client, this affair that he engaged in, and the judge, affair. Judge Cahill, who was also the judge in the Derek Chauvin trial, George Floyd, he right. was the same judge in, in that trial, he said, excuse me. <laughs> the judge did. Yeah. Judge Cahill said, excuse me, this was not an affair. This was a grown man committing a crime, mm. having sex with a child. And so you ask the child and she's awesome and she's mm. so much better and she's come through this. But at the time she thought she was in love. Yeah. She thought he loved her. And this is what people, he would say, this is what people in love do. Mm -hmm. This is what adults do. They have sex with each other and that's why we're doing this, mm -hmm. right? So it can be very confusing wow. to the psyche of a child. What about now? What are the, what do you, for you, I, you said you had some fertility issues I was reading. Oh yeah. What do you think some of the negative impacts are that you're either were aware of or were unaware of that maybe have come to the surface since this whole thing's come out? Yeah, so you hit on it. You said I'm a 50 year old guy thinking about this thing that happened to yeah. me as a child. Yeah. The average age of reporting child sex abuse is 52 years old. That has been demonstrated by scientific research. No kidding. 52 years old. Wow. And the question is, why? Why did yeah. I hang on to that for so long? Right. And it's these manifestations of abuse that you're talking about. Confusion, shame. Did I do something wrong? Did I ask for it. Mm. People turn to alcoholism, to drugs, trying to, you know, sort of mute the emotion in their body or in their psyche. And when you do that, when you shove something down into your body, you're going to have physical manifestations. Yeah. So my body began to attack itself mm. and I didn't know why. And I had something called endometriosis, sure. which is where the lining of your uterus grows on the outside of your, your uterus and fucks your whole stomach mm. and pelvic your pelvis up. Mm. And so I had this major reconstruction surgery. I come out of surgery at 33 years old mm. and my surgeon says to me, this is the worst case I've ever seen. Stage four, Whoa. you know, your ovaries, you've lost almost all of your ovary except for 10%. You're going to have massive fertility issues, blah, blah, blah. And he says to me, have you ever been sexually abused? No way. Do you know what I said? Mm. Oh. No. You said no. I said no. Hmm. I said no. I don't know what you're talking about. No, uh-uh, absolutely not. And wow. now I look it up and there's Harvard research, endometriosis directly tied. It's an, you know, autoimmune, the body's autoimmune response. It's attacking itself, right? And, and it's severely tied to child trauma, sexual trauma. My and I'm going, well, that explains a lot. <laughs> wow. That explains a lot. What right? about the statute of limitations thing? So you're, I'm just processing what you're saying there. Yeah. That's remarkable to me the 52 year old part of it. And since it's so late in life, I know part of the work you're doing is the statute of limitations. Why is there, I know you're working on extending it or changing yeah. it, but why is there any statute of limitations of any type? I'm just, I, I'm, to me logically, like if a crime like that happens, that kind of injustice, that kind of violation of another person, why would why is there any time horizon to which someone should pay the consequences for that behavior? That's a billion dollar question. Hmm. It is it is something I literally deal with every day. Why the f do these even exist, right. right? And you can see in some cases, let's say murder, right? Yep. There's evidentiary, you know, repercussions of bringing a case 50 years later right. and there's no DNA and there's no blood stains right. and there's right. But when you look at sexual abuse <laughs> and you look at the sexual abuse of a child and you look at what psychologically and physically goes on when someone experiences trauma mm. it makes no sense that mm. statutes of limitations exist right. now in my opinion why they exist is to protect 
powerful organizations from liability. And there's a lot of money that goes into the pockets of certain legislators mm -hmm. that, you know, mm. keeps them singing the old tune mm. of maybe mm. it's unconstitutional to change this, right? There are mm -hmm. all these excuses right. of why we can't change statutes why because you're making money mm. for your campaign you're making money for your issues to mm. be moved forward right mm. so it shouldn't be a battle mm. and it actually in my opinion should should be federal there should it, there should be some federal mandate rather than every state having arbitrary statutes where this state because it swings a certain way yep. has great law this state because it swings the other way has terrible mm. law i reside part of the time in pennsylvania philadelphia and i worked really hard in new york and new jersey and also california to get good statutes and mm -hmm. to get retroactive windows where someone like yourself could bring a case mm -hmm. for your on behalf of mm -hmm. your five or eight year old self mm -hmm. right but 20 minutes away in Pennsylvania if you were abused you're fucked. Wow. and sometimes it's the same perpetrator in multiple states of course and this contingency of survivors mm -hmm. has recourse mm -hmm. but this contingency has none tell mm -hmm. me how that makes sense that makes no sense and people that typically commit these kind of crimes there's no age uh, barrier in which they stop so if they've been getting away with it when they were in their 30s and you're under the same man in his 60s, he's probably still doing the same thing to another child. So exactly. I think this protecting of these big organizations is true. And I'm not a big identity politics guy, you know, male, female type thing, but also, you know, uh, by the way, both genders uh, abuse people and molest yes, children. Yes, totally. But, but, but men do it more than women do statistically. And it almost is something that protects men from get out of jail free cards at some point. So to some extent, men abuse uh, more than women do. Women do the abuse, but also, but it's a, it's a thing that I just think we should all be thinking through and getting behind. Why would we ever not want children to feel protected and adults from any type of abuse at any point in their life that they yes. can bring that forward? And why should we strong arm them right. into coming forward when they're not ready? Good and point. why should we punish them mm -hmm. if they didn't come forward in time to have access to the judicial system? How did USA Gymnastics react when you guys first came forward? <laughs> right? You could ask, you could ask, how are they reacting now, mm -hmm. and how did they react when you first when you first came forward? It's the exact same reaction. That right, which Nothing is has changed wow. lawyer up protect the brand sweep it under the rug try to you know get these women to stop talking stop doing press mm -hmm. right it's all lawyered up flowery PR mm -hmm. and you have someone like Simone Biles mm -hmm. who is competing with the Olympic rings and USA Gymnastics on her back and she is saying these are organizations that I do not believe in that have never protected me that threw me to the wolves who I am currently in litigation with mm. and now I have to go to the Olympics and try to win medals on their behalf mm. when their compensation is directly tied to how many golds she brings home. Crazy. That's crazy. I thought you were going to tell me that it was really bad in the beginning and they sort of acquiesced. You're saying it's still the same Nothing's play. Nothing's changed. We're in litigation, active litigation. I am a plaintiff in active litigation against USA Gymnastics and against the United States Olympic and Paralympic Committee. Mm. Nothing has changed. Bananas. At all. Bananas. And speci specifically about Simone. I was going to ask you about this anyway. Yeah. You know, it's it fascinating to me because this is the story. It's like the lead's been buried, even in the country. Like people, half the people watching the show are like, I know about Larry Nasser. I'm going to hear more about it today. The other half don't even know. They don't know anything. Or they've heard like a little tiny piece about it. This is still ongoing after yes. 150 women speak up at his trial in one way, shape, or form. There's yes. 500 some odd victims. And that's just one dude. Yep. This getter dude, whatever his name is, he yep. was a complete creeper. Yep. God, you know, I know he's gone, but... You know, he he created an environment where you all were almost safer with Larry than you were we with were. him, which is we were. But in Simone's case, yeah, it's fascinating to me. She, she took a lot of flack, obviously, and there's this defensive. You know, she's getting that thing where she loses direction in the air, all that. Yeah. But I just was thinking because I knew that I wanted to do this with you. I was thinking the weight 
I mean, that all of you are carrying, but that she's carrying, she's still representing the same organization yes. with all this abuse. Yes. She's also a previous medal winner. She's one of the greats of all time. She's carrying the weight of that. She's in the active game. She's got this. Why was more of the conversation not centered around this when she was having a few of these issues? Do you know why? Because the networks that are covering this have been told to bury it. My God. It is the cover up in this instance. I mean, they destroyed over 500 little girls, but the cover up in this story is so far much worse than the crime. The FBI sat on it. The FBI covered it up. The Office of Inspector General put out a report. I mean, this is not me having an opinion. This is a fact put out by the Office of Inspector General that the FBI buried it and they never picked up the phone once they knew that Larry Nassar was a pedophile and called Simone's parents and told them for 16 months. They did not tell her parents. He went home to Michigan State. He abused 120 more girls in those intervening months, some of whom I'm very close to, and they were 10, 11, 12, right? Amazing. And so the cover-up, why is this not covered more? I think probably the story of hard knocks and mental illness maybe makes a better story. People don't, it's, it's hard to face very wealthy entities. It's hard to speak out mm. against the machine. It is. I don't give a f I, yeah. I, I have been so harmed in my life, I, and I am a mother of two little girls now. Mm. I don't give a f I say a lot, I right? I pound the pavement, I keep talking, I'm not going away yeah. until kids are safe, but it's hard yeah. to be the one that says, no, United States Olympic Committee, yep. I'm gonna take you on, or no, mm. you know, Harvey Weinstein or Jeffrey Epstein or, you know, whoever, I'm gonna take you on, Woody Allen. That's hard. You're right. Right? I and really admire you, I respect you. And it's not always, you just made such a great point. It's not always these, these big organizations, it's their co-conspirators. Ah! It's the production company that supports the famous producer Correct. that got the money behind them. It's it's the uh, the television networks that benefit financially from the gymnastics ratings, which are oh, highly rated on television. Correct. And I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. Endorsements, network deals, mm. leotard companies, mm. the, you know, it, and the list goes on. And mm. there is so much more, these pockets are deep. It, mm. It's money and it's brand. It's it's a it, it's treating little girls like commodities. Mm. And mm. you know you're you're a father to a beautiful yeah. daughter who I met today. Yeah, yeah. It's her birthday, yeah, right? Okay. Beautiful girl. She's Thank about you. to go out into the world. I have two little girls. Mm. I can't sleep at night if I don't use my mouth. Right. And, and that's I don't have all the money in the world, mm. but I have my mouth. And they care about brand, mm. and they care about me doing things like this, where yeah. I talk about the truth. I, I, again, I'm, it, I'm these aren't my opinions. No, these are facts. facts. I'm thrilled. I'm I'm thrilled to be a tiny, you know, little bit of the platform that, you know, can get this out. I was when I was prepping and just sitting here. You know, so I'm so enamored with you and and so. Um, just proud of you and grateful Thank for you. you. But when I was preparing for this and even sitting here today, I found myself getting so angry that uh, you know these are these are little girls that we're talking about here. These are our children. Which even more bizarre to me is that it's our national family too. You know, yeah. as a country, yeah. that you'd think this would just be yeah. shock and awe campaign raining down from everywhere. Yeah. To to, and by the way, this is just a microcosm of situations that are happening in little small towns somewhere Correct. every day. Every day. As you're listening to this interview or watching it, there's somebody doing something to a child that shouldn't be done and it needs to be called out. The light needs to be shined on it. Yes. And we need to be resolved in helping them. Is there anything, maybe this sounds, you know, fluffy, but is there anything we could all be doing yeah. to help you help this cause, help the overall mission here. Yeah, I mean, continuing to sh shine a light on these stories, right? Mm -hmm. And social media is powerful mm -hmm. and it's been our best friend in the Nassar case. Mm -hmm. But in a way, we got the red carpet rolled out for yeah, us. We right. were a bunch of little white girls. And you're well known. In Lansing, Michigan, mm -hmm. right? Like, gymnastics is cute and whatever. But not everybody gets a stage at the ESPYs right. to shine a light on your own story. And mm -hmm. I think COVID has been really difficult for a lot of children because they're 
are oftentimes at home with their abuser or they're put in situations they don't have an outlet like a school or a school counselor or whatever. And mm -hmm. what you said is so true. This is happening in your community, whoever's watching this, yeah. right? I, you know, I, I think of a case I have right now with a pediatrician pedophile in this tiny little town in central Pennsylvania. He was basically one of the only pediatricians you could find mm. in the town and he abused kids for 40 years he was criminally sentenced for life mm. and now we're working on um, the civil case but it Good. is happening everywhere and, and i think continuing this isn't a fun conversation people don't like yep. talking about kids getting harmed yep. it makes people uncomfortable it's much more fun to watch the kardashians right i also think sarah i think people think it's rarer than it really is yeah meaning you you in your mind you think what a monster yeah. would do this to a child yep. there's very few monsters yeah but the truth is and there's degrees of everything in life as well, yeah. right? So there's inappropriateness that goes up scales. Yeah. And from starting from the, the, the spectrum of something bad all the way to horrific, there's more people doing this than you think. I just, it made me think when we were doing this, most of my audience knows that my, my introduction to personal development, to wanting to help people was, I was done playing my baseball career. I ended up getting a, a job at a a gigantic group home but it was really an orphanage and yeah. my boys were all removed from their homes and I would walk in and these were these beautiful boys all my boys were eight years old Ugh. black Asian Hispanic Indian yeah. white children some of them came from affluent homes some of them came from poor homes all of them though the majority of them had been molested oh. by the age of eight and I remember they would all go off to school every day all the different classrooms and some of them went to different schools too when they would leave our home and i was thinking in almost every classroom there's the potential that there's a child going through this sort of trauma somewhere on yeah. some level statistically there is it's amazing that there we is. think it's rare yeah and so because that's so true what are some of the signs as a parent potentially yeah. and by the way if you are a parent or an uncle or an auntie who might have a parent doing this to a child that they care about are there signs we can be looking for in children we love, number yeah. one, yeah. and then two, reverse it. Are there, are there things that parents should be looking for when their children are around other people as yeah. well? Yeah. What would you say? So I say, and I hate to say this because I'm an eternal optimist and yeah. I believe in good, but when you walk into your kid's school or when you look at your kid's sports team, who's the most popular teacher? Who's the most popular coach? Who's the one spending extra time with all? You're that's right. the one you better keep your fucking eyes on right. because that's the one earning the trust. That's the one grooming. That's the one, right? Mm. So keep Sorry. your eyes open. Mm. The one you least expect, the one you trust the most, the one where you say, my mother says to me to this day, I believed Larry Nassar would not hurt a fly, mm. right? He was that guy. To this day. He was that guy. Mm. So keep your eyes open. And in terms of being a parent, again, I talked about giving your child that language. My daughter knows she's five. Who's allowed to wipe her on the potty if she needs help? Who's allowed to mm. see her changing her clothes? And that list is about this big, right? Even our beautiful college age babysitters. Mm. I love them. I trust them. They're not allowed to wipe my daughter on the potty. Sure. The end, right? Sure. And so teaching her about never keeping secrets from mommy, about her body, you know, she'll say to me, mommy, I'm in charge of my own body. I've taught her that. And Good. sometimes it backfires on me because I want to kiss her a <laughs> hundred times right. and she'll say, mommy, I'm done. I'm in right. charge of my own body. <laughs> and I'll say, you're right. And I have to respect that, Sure. you know? And so, and so having these hard conversations, mm. you don't have to overexpose your child to the world being evil. You don't mm. have to overexpose your child child to the topic of children being raped, mm. but giving them that autonomy, giving mm. them that sense of self. Very I self. often attribute the fact that I was abused at eight years old to, I never developed a sense of self. I, I was never, I was so young. I, I never was, was taught that my voice mattered, that what I wanted would be respected, what I didn't want wouldn't. My coach told me, do whatever the I tell you to do mm -hmm. even when you're oh your legs broken do it 10 times instead wow. of five you know so I didn't I was a blank robot mm. of a shell of a child mm. right and so mm. um, and so I didn't have the words to say 
please stop or oh. I'm uncomfortable. Mm. I, I was, I was a, a, a shell. That's amazing to me. What you said uh, is such a hard thing to say about it being the popular coach yeah. or the popular teacher. But I must say in reflection in my situation, and I'm not sure what happened in my situation. I'm really not. I know this. I'm 50 years old, and I can remember it very clearly, yeah. the lead up. And so it left some kind of mark on me. It wasn't yeah. just another day at school. Correct. I know that. Um, but it was exactly that person. It was the cool guy. Everyone liked him. My parents liked him. Uh, he took extra time, and which is such a tough thing because there's all these amazing coaches and teachers and out there that, that, that right? do that, that aren't doing this, Correct. but it still comes with it. I think the second piece I would just add, as by the way, having nowhere near the <laughs> credibility that you have, is if your child says anything to you, believe them. Oh, I mean, that's number one. When a client walks into our office, mm. our, our, the first thing we say is we believe you and this mm. was not your fault. You did nothing wrong, and it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of ten, that person will burst into tears and say, "You are the first person oh gosh, to crazy. say that to me. Thank you so much." Whew. Because especially when you're taking on that popular, cool, whatever, it's terrifying because you know there's going to be that contingency that says they would never do that, mm -hmm. right? When the news broke about Larry. Oh, my teammates flew from all over the country to go to Larry's house to comfort him. Wow. They, and still to this day, my teammates and I, my teammates, my ride or dies, have no relationship because they chose John and Larry over my truth. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until they recovered the 37,000 images of child pornography, including images of Larry's own children oh on the hard drive that were in the trash can about to go out to the garbage that day, that they actually said, well, I guess mm. this could have happened. My goodness. So this it's is, hard. Can I give you an observation? Yeah. I really sit in the presence of people when I interview them. Yeah. And uh, the most pain on your face today yeah. was not when you're talking about Larry or even Gettert or all the FBI or any of that. It was the pain of your teammates yep. um, going the other way. Like your face literally changed. It broke still, my heart. Yeah. It, it broke my heart mm. because my word and my truth mm. wasn't enough mm. because of the grooming. And, and I don't blame them. Sure. I don't talk to them, mm -hmm. but I don't blame them because they were victims as well. Right, and in some cases, this is the other thing too, we need to remember so that we believe a victim. Just think logically, everybody. So a murderer doesn't murder every person, <laughs> right? An yeah. abuser doesn't abuse every child. Yep. So because they didn't abuse you or another child at the school or on the team does not discount the fact that they could have potentially harmed another child. Yeah. This is what we do. We go, well, he didn't do it to me, so he didn't do it to you. Correct. That's not how it works, yep. right? So let's just be very clear about it. I'm, I'm curious also, the overall impact on the ladies now, most of them are grown women, that you now interact with, what are just some, what's the ramifications in the lives of some of these beautiful women who were, you have to remember too, we're talking about some of the most disciplined young people on the planet are yep. involved in USA Gymnastics. Yeah. Disciplined, sacrificing, working hard. These are special young women as well. Yeah. What, what have been some of the ramifications? I'm curious. Thanks for seeing them in that way because they mm. are mm. such special, beautiful yeah. people and mm. I appreciate when they're seen. Sure. Um, the ramifications are lifelong. So when you're murdered, your body Mm. is killed. Yep. When you're raped as a child, your soul and your psyche are in a sense killed. And it takes a lifetime mm. of hard work, therapy, it's anxiety, it's depression, it's eating disorders, it's alcoholism, it's substance abuse, it's um, inability to function, inability to get up, have a job, mm. go to work, trust relationships, inability to get into relationships, sexual issues, wow. and the list goes wow. on. Wow. And I wow. am proud that I've been able to be strong enough to in some ways be a, a voice mm. for my younger sister survivors and those who don't want to go out there and talk about this, but I also never wanted to be, never want to be painted in, you know, a way that it's like, she got past it. Look at that bright, shiny, badass mm. lawyer. Mm. She's so cool. She got over her abuse. Yeah. I still have those days. Yeah. I still 
have those days I'm still in therapy. I'm a huge believer. Good. I have a regular therapist. I have a trauma therapist. I still get triggered. I still, you know, sometimes question my intuition. You know, mm -hmm. it's a process. It's like getting on your yoga mat. They say you get on and you practice every day. You never arrive. Mm -hmm. That's what healing is like. Mm -hmm. And that's what, what this healing journey is. It's a lifetime thing. Um, mm. I've been able to find immense gratitude and it sounds really crazy. People are like, she yeah. must be smoking something, but yeah. I, I have found immense gratitude for what happened to me. I would not change a minute I you. of my life. Yeah. Why? Because here I am, I'm on the mat yeah. and it has been so cathartic for me to be able to walk other survivors through the legal process, to meet my younger self where mm. I once was, to take that hand and to say, we've got this, I'm the bigger, stronger bully now, nobody's ever gonna hurt you again, and I'm gonna be sure of it. Wow. And, you, and you I'm grateful. In, you know what, you know what you, it's true by the way, when you walked in, just because I knew your story, yeah. I thought I was gonna meet somebody who had a heaviness to them. Do you know yeah. what I mean by that? Yes. An emotional heaviness yeah. to them. And immediately you were incredibly light, infectious energy, smiling. Thank and I think you. that's important for people to know about you. What you're showing up here right now in the interview is how you show up off camera. Thank you. That you, you know, you don't, you can work through these things, you have to carry them. You said something profound, because I think there's some people listening to the interview that didn't have this type of trauma. Yeah. And they say to themselves, well, it's, I'm really upset about this. I want to do something, but it doesn't, it's not me. Yeah. But most of us need to go, you said something so beautiful there, go and meet that younger you and kind of grab her hand. Yeah. And so many of us need to do that. We are, as adults, most of us are working through something from our childhood. Yes. It could be as simple as trying to still get your mom or dad's recognition. Maria Shriver did my show. Yeah. She's, she's had one of the most remarkable lives of all time. We, we and I were talking about Maria Pryor. And she literally told me on the show that her father, who's passed away, who had had Alzheimer's, was a great man, he accomplished so many things in his life. She said, he's no longer even here, and I still find myself sometimes trying to earn his admiration and recognition. Yes. And so we are all working through, the more we can go back and just acknowledge things that happened in our childhood that we're working through, it'll help you understand yourself now. Yes. The bigger question I had for you, though, this is a hard one. Yeah, yeah. And Bring I didn't know I was gonna, I wanted to ask, I, did, I wanted to ask you, but I wasn't sure I was gonna ask you till I met you, now I know I wanna ask okay. you. Okay. And so, this is the tough one. So, we wanna work through these things from our childhood. And if you are a victim of any type of abuse, or just even neglect, yeah. maybe you grew up without a parent in your house, right? Or maybe no one hugs you, yep. you know? Maybe there's, there's neglect in your life. How do you work through it, but not make being a victim your identity, particularly in your case, because you're involved now in sort of the sexual abuse world and defending people that do that in the legal side. Yeah. But I don't sense that it's your identity. At meaning all. <laughs> at all. It's not your identity. No. But would you agree with me that many people take this issue, yes. whatever's happened to them, and it becomes a permanent part of their identity the remainder of their life, and they never escape the identity. And to me, that abuser is now still abusing you, or that neglect that happened to you is still neglecting you if it makes it your entire identity the rest of your life. Do you not agree with that? I totally agree with yeah. that and i know people who are professional victims mm -hmm. right professional survivors i mm -hmm. want to go tell the story of hard knocks over and over yes. and over i do a lot of speaking i mm -hmm. do a lot of interviews i do a lot of this mm -hmm. but my message is always one of hope yeah. you can be a full complex beautiful person and this is such a little part of who I am mm -hmm. but I come back to life as choices mm -hmm. and I come back to being in the driver's seat of my own life mm -hmm. and am I going to let Larry Nassar and John Geddert take one more ounce of me absolutely not I'm a happy person I love to laugh yeah. I love to have fun this happened to me but I'm a woman I am mm -hmm. a mother I am mm -hmm. a lawyer I I have a I'm a friend I'm a daughter I have I have so many other identities that feel so much better mm. than victim. Mm. I will say, I love the identity of a survivor, mm -hmm. not just of sexual abuse, but mm. I survived something mm. and now look at me. I love you, right? that's awesome. And now look at me. Yeah. So I think everybody can relate to that. Mm. You have all survived something, mm. a divorce, you know, a death of, of a loved one or a parent, you know, cancer, whatever, you know, whatever, we all have our
Mm. I got mine out of the way the first 40 years of my life. I know a lot of people did too, but a lot mm. of people have yet to face theirs. Mm. You can walk into that ring of fire. You can walk the f out the other side. You can be a full and complete and loved and loving person, not despite all of that, but in spite of all of that. I'm no different than you. You've had your own shit, mm -hmm. right? Mine looks like sexual abuse. Yours look like whatever mm -hmm. it looks like, right? Mm -hmm. Every person listening to that has their own shit. Guess what? Your life can still be good. It can still be happy. It can still be fine. And you can still make a fucking difference. Are you going to let it happen to you and go in fetal position in your bed and never come out? Or is it going to happen to you and you're going to get the fuck up and say somebody else can benefit from my story? Somebody else can be better off for having encountered mm. me? That's a choice. Mm. Life is choices. I know what I choose. Oh my gosh. That's one of my favorite things that's ever been said on the show, particularly coming from you because of your, your story. I just think you're awesome. <laughs> I just do. I just, I really do. Like I, I wanted to do the show because I knew that it would be an important thing to get out. But now I've met you, and I'm like, I now I think the important thing is people hearing from you. Which reminds me, you started a podcast. I want to make sure that people know about that. So, tell them a little bit about your podcast and how they can get it. What's it called? Thank you. It's called Bar Fights, taking on issues that matter, and it's mm. not exclusively about sexual abuse mm. or cults or whatever. I had mm. Catherine Schwarzenegger Pratt yeah. on. We talked about forgiveness, mm. right? Something everybody can relate to. Mm. Everybody needs to know about. I had a mental skills coach who coaches Olympic athletes on. I had, mm. you know, a woman who works for the NFL who broke the glass ceiling. It's it's all the issues that we all need to talk about and mm. sometimes aren't fun, but sometimes are a lot of fun. And so bar fights, um, you can find it on, on Apple Podcasts. Okay. You can find me on Instagram yep. at Sarah, S-A-R-A-H G Klein, K-L-E-I-N. I'm on Twitter. Google me, I'm all the f over the place. And I said to you when I arrived, yeah. you know, I'm you asked if I if there's anything I w don't want to talk about. I said mm. I'm an open book. To me, that's authenticity. Yeah. If I don't come here and lay it all out, mm. that's inauthentic to my own heart. Yeah. And so I'm all over the place. Yeah. And yeah. you know This this conversation flew by. It's how good it was. <laughs> no, didn't you feel it? Like seriously, it flew I by. Know. The reason is when you're as authentic and as vulnerable as you are. Let me tell you one of the things that's so critical about that's wonderful about you makes other people being become comfortable themselves being authentic and vulnerable and it helps even for me talking to you I wasn't I'm surprised I shared this with with my uh, my gym coach just felt comfortable doing Thank it you. so if you want to have other people open up you've got to be present what you do really really well that I just want to give the audience the key of is that even though you're telling your story you help other people feel seen and heard and one of the things millions of people don't feel every day it's what I hope my show does for all of you is that this is a place you can come and learn, but also that you can see and hear yourself in the show and know that I love you and I care about you and your family and your lives. And I bring you people like Sarah mm. because I know they can improve your life in some measurable way. That's how I, by the way, when the show's over, I, when we're done, I go, did we help people's lives? Did yeah. we change lives? Did we potentially save lives yep. today? Do, and it could be a nutrition show. Did we improve their life nutritionally? It doesn't matter. Today did all of them. It checks all of the boxes. We improve lives, we've changed lives, and I know that we saved a few lives too, or you did rather. So thank you for being here uh, today, Sarah. Thank you so much. Cheers, I'm a by the huge way. Fan. To Cheers. you overcoming and winning, and not just surviving, you're thriving. Thank you, yeah. and to a beautiful friendship. Yes, the beginning yeah. of a friendship. We're not awesome. even that far away, so we, we're going <laughs> to do dinner very soon. Yes. Hey, guys, we did it again. This is the best show in the world, fastest growing show in the world for a reason. There's some big announcements coming about the show here very, very soon. And I'm just grateful to all of you for being so loyal to it and sharing it regularly like you do with people that you love and care about that you think it'll bring value to. I just ask you to continue to do that. And God bless you. Max out. Hey, guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.